Uh, let's, uh, let's dive in and, and wrap this up. This has been a great series for us um, called Seven. And we have been walking through the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches um, in the book of Revelation 2 and 3. And you may have noticed in structure, they're all similar in structure, but they're unique to each specific church. Um, and basically what he fills them with is this host of commendations, uh, condemnations, criticisms, uh, commands. And then he ends each letter with this promise for those who hear his words, those who have ears to hear, who hear him and respond to him. And he's done that uh, each week and he has never failed to show something to us. And I, he's done a great work in me and my study and time through this. And I pray that he's done that with you as well. Uh, go back on our app. You can watch all of them in just succession. That's how they're best read and best watched and understood. But uh, we looked at the church in Ephesus which was this, this legalistic, fundamental church. They were all head and no heart. They had lost their first love. And to that church in Ephesus, he says, love. We looked at the church in Smyrna. They were um, persecuted, slandered, impoverished. And to them, he said, stay faithful. Keep doing what you are doing. We looked at the church in Pergamum. Uh, that church, uh, they followed Jesus but they also followed the patterns of the world. They compromised Jesus uh, because they were living like the world. And he said to them, don't compromise. And we looked at the church in Thyatira. Uh, and they were all heart, no head. They loved Jesus, uh, but they were biblically blind. They didn't understand scripture. They didn't read scripture. So therefore, they tolerated sin and they tolerated false teaching into the church. And he said to them to... He said, stop being so tolerant. And we looked at the church in Sardis, and the church in Sardis would be known as a mega church. A lot of followers, the, the pews and the parking lot were full of a lot of people that seemingly looked alive. But he looked at them and says, hey, you're really not alive. You're really dead people. And I called, he called them out and says, wake up, you sleepy Christians. Wake up. And we looked at the church in Philadelphia last week. And they were a, a seemingly weak church from the outside looking in. Not impressive at all, but when we begin to see inside the church in Philadelphia, they were strong. They were mighty. They kept the word. They kept the gospel. And to them, he says, press on. Today, we're going to close out by throwing the last kind of pitch here in this series by looking at the church in Laodicea. Uh, and he's going to call this, we're going to call this clearly the lukewarm church. Now, uh, of all the seven Letters. This church is arguably the worst of all seven, uh, but also it's probably the most similar to the American church as well. So it would be good for all of us uh, to dial in and really hear these words, uh, the church in Laodicea. Now, as we do this, I'm going to give you a heads up clear. I'm just the waiter for this thing, right? I didn't cook the meal, so I want to kind of preface that by, by reading this. But let's look at this letter together, and then we'll begin to break this down. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And to the church of the angel in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you're neither cold nor hot, would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I have conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, 
These are solemn and sobering words filled with great warning. But it is written in love. It is written today so that we may see if there are any lukewarmness in us in our relationship with you, that we would confess that, that we would be repent of that, and we would turn and be zealous for you. Help us to see ourselves rightly today. By the power of the Holy Spirit doing its convicting work of grace so that we may move beyond where we are today. We love you. We study your word today. And we trust that it has the power to do what we need it to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Uh, A few years ago, I think it might have been maybe five, six years ago, me and Callie went on a mission trip in um, in Puebla, Mexico. It's one of the team trips that we take here. Uh, We went on a medical dental trip. So we go down there and help support and provide uh, medical and dental care for impoverished people in Puebla. Um, and and while, while, while patients in the villages are waiting to be seen by the doctors and physicians and dental assistants, uh, preachers from the neighboring towns would come in and preach the gospel in Hispanic um, in Spanish. So we would just be loving on kids, and everything was just going great on this team. It was an awesome trip. Weather was good. Loving on the kids. The gospel was being preached. And then the very one thing that you do not want to happen when you are out of the country And you are sitting in a village of 300 people with one outhouse for a bathroom. The one thing you don't want to happen, a stomach virus hits the team. Uh, One by one, the team began to drop. Uh, I think day, day one went by and two and three. I'm just like... Ah, I pray I don't get this. God, I don't want this. I don't want this. And I'm taking Germex, and I'm, Callie's handing me the Germex. We're just feverishly wiping it all of our hands. I probably even licked it or ingested it at some point. Like, I don't want this virus. And then I think it was night three. Uh, I'm sitting in this little tiny room that we were staying in. And uh, the stomach began to rumble, Earl began to call, and it wasn't long before I was bowing down, giving an offering uh, to the great white vomitorium. I'm sitting in there, and I'm just, uh, just blowing everything. For 24 hours, I puked like a champ. I mean, it was horrible. I hate throwing up, first of all. When I do, when I throw up, uh, my, my, the, the, the blood vessels around my eyes all start to pop out. Like, it just, it's an explosion because I don't have oxygen. I absolutely hate throwing up. I'd rather have uh, strep or the flu for a whole week than throw up for one single hour. I absolutely hate it. Uh, now, some of your parents are like, yeah, tell me about it. I just cleaned up puke this morning before church. Uh, but we hate these things. A lot of things make us stomach sick, right? Food poisoning. Uh, viruses make us sick. Uh, these things, a lot of things. Maybe my sermons make you sick sometime. I don't know. But a lot of things make us stomach sick. And here in this letter to the church in Revelation, we see what makes God sick. Lukewarm churches full of lukewarm Christians make him sick. These are sobering words. This is a church that is content, and a church is full of Christians who are content with themselves. They are content with pursuing the riches and the comforts of the world, wealth, materialism, prosperity. They're content with themselves, content with all of those things, and then they will casually have a, a lukewarm relationship with the church. They're content with a little bit of Jesus, but not too much Jesus. They are the mushy middle. And this, as I said, uh, describes the American church probably more so than any of all the other seven letters that we have studied. We need to pay very close attention to this. Now, as we read this today and begin to study this down, um, this is the, one of the most well-known letters, I think, of the seven I think we hear that story with the vomiting of Jesus out of the church, out of his mouth. We hear that. It's familiar. But what is very important here is that we understand the context of Scripture 
in this text here. Because if we don't understand the context of Scripture, we will take Scripture out of context. All right. So the topography, the history of the city of Laodicea will be very important uh, for us to all grab before he gets into these words and we understand why he's saying these words. First, the city of Laodicea was a very wealthy, independent, thriving, healthy city. Uh, They were known for three major things, banking, finances. They were a banking city. Uh, They were also known as a clothing manufacturer. They they produced uh, predominantly a black wool. Um, And they were also famous for having a medical school that produced eye ointments, salve for medicinal purposes for vision. All right, so very important things to hang on to as we understand these things. Now, they were also a very independent city, uh, independent to a fault. Um, Back in, um, I think it was AD 60, uh, a great earthquake came through the town, the city of Laodicea, and destroyed everything. Well, when Rome heard about it, they sent resources and money and funds to help them. And Laodicea said, no, thank you. We don't need your help. We are self-sufficient. We are independent. We don't need your stuff, Rome. Now, what we're going to see here in just a few moments is is that the church in Laodicea took on that same independent spirit as the city. All right? Uh, Now, another thing about uh, Laodicea, it seemed wealthy, it's thriving, healthy, all these things, but it had one great flaw. It had no water source whatsoever, no viable water source. In all its prosperity, it didn't have any water. So what they had to do is they had to get neighbor, watering from neighboring cities. Uh, to, the, to, the, to the south was uh, Colossae, um, and they would bring up water from the south. They would, have, they would have cold, refreshing waters that would come up, and it would come up through pipes or aqueducts underground, and they would filter all their water to Laodicea. Uh, They would also get uh, water from Hierapolis, which is a a neighboring city. They would get hot medicinal water from them. So they're getting their water supply from other sources because they did not have their own water supply. This will be very important, as as I said, as we begin to understand why Jesus is saying these very same things. So let's look at this in verse 14. And begin to break this down. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now, if you've been with us each week, you know that every single letter is tailor-made for that specific church. The way that Jesus uh, pronounces the situation, he speaks to their very unique situation. Uh, The rewards that he gives them is specific to their struggle. And the way that he announces himself speaks into the present situation of the church. So here when Jesus says, I am the amen, uh, here's what he's saying. Uh, I am the yes. I am the amen. I am the reliable. I am the true. I am the faithful witness. That stood in direct opposition to the church in Laodicea who said no who was unreliable and unfaithful witnesses. So he's saying, yes, I'm the amen, not you, right? Now he also goes on to say that he is the beginning of God's creation. Now this is important because there had been some heresy floating around in Laodicea, like often today Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons who were denying the eternality and the deity of Jesus. They were saying he is just a created being like everybody else. He's not the creator. And here in this passage, Jesus is saying, I am not a created thing. I was in the beginning at creation as a, as a man, he had a beginning, but as God, he was in the beginning. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. He says, I was there the whole time. I am creator. So he's renouncing the heresy that is spreading out. God says, I am inter- eternal. All right, so let's go on to the, uh, the beginning application here. 15 through 16, here's his words. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. I wish you'd rather be cold or hot. 
So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now Jesus, once again, he's announcing his omniscience as he's done in every single uh, letter here. As I know your works. I see your works. And I know you. You're not either hot or cold. And because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, this word spit here, um, it's used um, in Isaiah 19, 14, and it literally refers to vomit. That Isaiah 19, 14 uh, is referring to a drunk man staggering in his vomit. So this means literally vomit, and it makes him want to puke. That's what we're seeing here. Now, when Jesus says, I wish you were either cold or hot, uh, many people uh, misunderstand this text and they think that Jesus is basically saying, hey man, get in or get out. I wish you were either uh, burning hot with passion or burning in hell. Like get in or get out. Just do one or the other. And, and yes, we do see the Lord talking about us not limping between two opinions. We do know that. But that's not what's happening here in this text. This is why context is absolutely important to understand as we are reading. Remember, they had no water source, right? They had no viable water source. So they got their water from Hierapolis, which was a hot springs. So that that hot water from Hierapolis, which was 13 miles away, it was good for medicinal purposes, healing, aching uh, joints, for cooking. It was good hot water. But by the time it traveled all the way down to Laodicea, it became lukewarm. Now, in opposition, Colossia was known for its cold, refreshing mountain springs, for drinking, for cooling off the body. But by the time it traveled up to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. Warm. So the water was useless. It was good for nothing. So, what Jesus is saying here in this very moment here, I would, he's not saying I'd rather you be super spiritual or super wicked. He's saying, I wish you'd just be good for something. I I wish you would be good for something because no one likes lukewarmness. Uh, Think about a lukewarm cup of coffee from your Yeti. That's nasty, right? You'll spit it out. A lukewarm bath, right? Nobody wants a lukewarm bath. We want either cold or hot. Those are good things. They're purposeful, right? So he's saying to the church, I wish you'd either be this cold, refreshing drink or be hot, medicinal for healing. But because you are neither one, you are useless, good-for-nothing Christians. These are harsh, harsh words. They were halfway in between, the mushy middle. They were moderationist when it came to Jesus. So they, they weren't uninfluenced by Jesus. We do understand this. Like they went to church. I'll take a little bit of Jesus. You can influence me a little bit, but they were not going to go overboard. Everything in moderation for the church in Laodicea, including Jesus. Think about their threat there. I mean, he didn't mince any words. He clearly said, as I take a cup to my mouth to drink from you, church, and lay out a sea and make me sick, I'll spit you out of my mouth. These are harsh, harsh words, as I said. They're shocking to a lukewarm Christian. I think that this idea of spitting, being spit out of Jesus' mouth. I, I study that, and I don't see any way, shape, or form uh, that this means that a person's going to be saved. Like, it, there's just no way. A vomiting out of the mouth means I am, uh, I am disgusted by you. You are not with me. You are really not following me. And he vomits them out of their mouth. The lukewarm Christian who refuses to repent stays in the mushy middle and moderation of Jesus. To the very, very end, he will vomit you out of your mouth because you were never with him to begin with. 
Now, this, these words here, we need to understand, obviously, God doesn't get physically sick, right? The coronavirus flees from Jesus Christ. But lukewarm Christianity makes him want to puke. And we'll begin to look, look at what that looks like here today. Verse 17, like why does he have these words? Like where is he getting this accusation to the church in Laodicea? How does he know that they are lukewarm? We'll begin to see these things in verse 17. Let's look at this together. For you say, I'm rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So here, in that one verse, we see three symptoms of lukewarmness. Let's see if we have any of these, uh, if we're really willing to do the work here today. Uh, Three symptoms. The first one is they had this obsession with money. They had an obsession with money. They uh, imagine being in this church of Laodicea and receiving these letters, receiving these words from Jesus Christ. Now, they were physically wealthy, as we said, and they had sweet homes, lots of cash, physically healthy. They could see all of these things and Jesus is saying basically to them, you're wretched, poor, blind, and naked. Um, You must have known their response here. Really, we're poor? Like, have you seen our houses, man? Uh, You think we're naked and have no clothes? We have a closet full of clothes. You calling us blind? Man, we got eye salve and 2020 vision. That's, that was the point of this thing. They were so rich and so prosperous, they were pursuing money more than God. And it led them into a false sense of security with God. They thought that the blessings of God equaled prosperity and riches, and therefore they thought that they were good with God. They had an obsession with money. I want you to see why this is so similar to the church in America. Because they thought they were rich, right? This is our country right here. This is us. We are rich. We are in the one percentile of the entire world. We are rich people. We do understand this. If I threw $2 bills out on the floor right now, no one goes for it. Like, it's just two bucks. If I did that in a third world country, there are going to be people that are going to be fighting to the death for $2 because it will feed their family. Rich. If you have more than one car in your family, you are rich. If you're eating three meals a day, you are rich. If you have a closet full of clothes, you are rich. We don't pray for daily bread. We throw away bread. We are abundantly and filthy rich in this country. We have to start there. So were they, but they were under a false security that they were good with God. The abundance of possessions and wealth that they had gave them a false sense of security. Now, being rich, of course, isn't bad. Having a lot of possessions is not bad. We know that several people in the scriptures were wealthy and abundant. We have Abraham, David, Solomon. These, they were rich. So how do you know that your richness uh, becomes lukewarmness or affects you being lukewarm? When you pursue money more than God. Very simply put, today, if you are here and you desire money the comforts of the world, materialistic things more than God, you are lukewarm. Do you pursue and want and desire money more than God? If you do, you are a lukewarm Christian. There's no way to get around it. No absolute way to get around that. What is your greatest pursuit? So the first one, the first symptom there is an obsession with money will make you lukewarm. The second one we see here 
is a spiritual blindness to their own condition. The, these Christians in the church in Laodicea, they thought themselves to be rich, prosperous. They needed nothing from God. They're doing great. But in reality, reality Jesus is telling them, you're blind, you're beggars, you're poor, naked, homeless people. But they didn't see it, right? They were blind to their own reality and their own spiritual condition. Imagine seeing a homeless man uh, walking down the street. You see a homeless man while you're walking down the street. and You look at him and it's this homeless, broke, beggar, blind, like nothing. And you walk up to him and you say, hey, can I help you? Can I give you anything? And they look back at you and they say, I'm totally fine. I'm rich. I'm wealthy. Look at my abundance. I don't know what you're talking about, right? We would say, that guy is crazy. Well, this passage shows us that we have this propensity to not see ourselves rightly, to always think that we are better than we really are. That will cause you to be lukewarm, thinking that you're better than you actually are. Now, one of the ways that you can see this play out is American Idol. Anybody American Idol fans in the room? Right, yet? Yeah. Uh, me and Callie, it's one of our shows we watch together, and you see these people. They're in the auditions, and they're, that's, that's the best rounds for me, seeing these first-timers get in there. I'm like, how in the world does that guy get in there? But you get in there, you start watching these guys sing, and they're, they think they're so good. Someone in their life has told them that they sound like Bono, right? But you know the story. They're, it's more like, oh, no. They're nothing like Bono. And you're like, someone please tell this guy that they are not good. It sounds horrible. How in the world do they not see themselves rightly? This is exactly the point here. We are all people who think we are way better than we actually are. We look around at the people beside us think we're doing better than them we don't like to point the finger at our own sin we have spiritual blindness in our life we don't see our blind spots we think we're doing good and when you think you're good you will become lukewarm you'll be stagnant in your faith you'll be judgmental of others you'll be well more interested in the sin of other people than your own so how do you get out of that how do you get out of of spiritual blindness to your own sin well it's when you Pick up your Bibles and you begin to look at the Word of God. And it is a straight edge that shows you the crookedness of your own life. You get around other Christians in the community who help encourage you to point out your blind spots. Man, to show you your weaknesses and love and care for you. Hey, you're not as good as you think you are. This this is how we become aware of our own sin and avoid lukewarmness in our lives. By becoming in touch with the sin that deceives us, right? If sin still remains in us, and it does, it will always blind us to our badness. We will always fight against thinking we are better than we actually are. And when we do, we will be lukewarm. But I think the essence of lukewarmness here that we see in this passage here The essence of being lukewarm is found in verse 17 when this people in this church said, I need nothing. They said, I need nothing. This I need nothing was, I need nothing from you, God. I'm independently living, self-reliant. I'm doing pretty good, and I need nothing from you. You. They treat God, uh, they, they kind of stiff arm God and treat him like a, a, a salesman on the porch of their house. Hey, don't, don't come too close, man. I don't need anything from you. I have enough God in my life. I don't need more of you. You stay where you are. This cold and personal relationship with God is a reflection of lukewarmness. I need nothing from God. Like you literally, if you stripped away church, you didn't have God in your life and you were fine with that. 
Like with your wealth and your prosperity and your, your children and your life and your happiness and your job and your house. You're just fine. And you say, I need nothing from you, God. And they had fallen away and they had forgotten that their greatest need in life was God. That he was everything. I want to caution the one in the room today who thinks that they don't need more of God. Like you're sitting there, you're like, I have enough God in my life, man. I don't need more God. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said about this idea of longing to know more. He who does not long to know more of Christ knows nothing of him yet. Whoever hath sipped this wine will thirst for more. For although Christ doth satisfy, yet it is such a satisfaction that the appetite is cloyed, is not cloyed, but wetted. Do you desire more of Christ in your life today? Do you want more of him? Do you want more uh, zeal for him, more knowledge of Christ and his word? Do you want more boldness in your evangelism and your witness? Do you want more intimacy of Jesus Christ? If you do not, you are lukewarm. God did not save the Christian to leave them in a posture of lukewarmness. We are people who understand that without Christ we have nothing. But with Christ we have everything. So I've got a few here. I want to see if we can make this these signs and symptoms of being lukewarm. Continuing on the thread and the idea. You know when you Google something or you go to WebMD to find symptoms of a condition. Uh, well, the Bible kind of gives us these uh, signs and symptoms of lukewarmness. Is your commitment to church convenient or is it committed? Like, do you look for reasons to uh, find an excuse to not go to church when it should be the exact opposite way around? Are you one of the once or twice a monthers? You pop up every once in a while. A little bit of Jesus, don't want too much Jesus. Four times a month? Are you kidding me? I'll do two. If that's your posture towards the church, you might be lukewarm. Think about relation to your Bible. Does your Bible have a little dust on it? On the outside, but on the inside, the pages are crisp. Perfectly folded together because they've never felt your fingers. That might be an indication you might be lukewarm. Do you use the church to consume at services only coming to be served? If that's you, you're probably lukewarm. Do you desire and long to share the gospel with people? And are you sharing the gospel with people? If you are not, you are probably lukewarm. These are marks of people who have this zealous passion for Jesus. They're not perfect. They're very aware of their sin. They're very aware of their desperate situation of Christ. They, they're, they're well aware of their brokenness, but they do not settle into the mushy middle. They do not keep Christ at arm's length. They desire to know more of him. And the reality is this. I have ne never met a person who has that relationship with Christ and his church. All the things I have. I've never met someone who's doing all of those things and is on fire for Jesus. Like I, I've just not. I've never met someone who's zealous and fiery for Jesus, and then they tip God, they don't tithe. Never met them. Just not. I've never met someone who's on fire for Jesus, zealous for Jesus, and they have this lukewarm relationship with the church. What God has called them to frequent and join together, they just regularly, uh, they just consider it optional. Never met them. 
If these things are marks of your life today, you must heed these words. See yourself rightly. Why? He's going to talk about these things in just a moment because there's grace coming your way. If you're seeing yourself rightly and you're like, that's me, ouch, I think I'm doing that, ouch, what do I do? Where's the grace? This is kind of harsh, right? Here comes the grace in verse 18 on how we can change our posture. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. So he just told them they were broke, they were blind, and they were beggars, and they had nothing. So how do they buy gold then, right? How do you buy gold if you're blind, broke, deaf, beggars? How do you do it? By his grace. He By his grace and his salvation gives to us. He clothes us in white garments of righteousness. He gives us a place to call our own. He makes us prosperous, covers our nakedness. He does all of the things. By his grace, we can obtain all of these things, but only by his grace. Only when we could admit that without God... That we are blind, broke, dead, lifeless beggars. And these words that he's saying are very harsh today. We've talked about that today. But what he says here, he says, those who I'm, whom I love, I discipline. He says, these words are to discipline the ones that I love. And we think discipline is a, is a, is a punitive word. That's where our minds go immediately. It's punitive. It's, 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 it's all these things. It's just pouring out wrath. That's not, what, that's not what discipline is. Discipline is for those who he loves to redeem. Now, the way that God loves, first of all, God loves all people, all people on the face of the earth, but he has a very specific, unique covenantal, salvific love for those who follow Jesus. He says, those are the ones that I will discipline because I love them. And we know that principle is true in parenting, right? You know those parents who never discipline their kids? And no one wants to be around that kid, right? You're like, if I could just get five minutes with that kid, I'll show them some discipline, right? Parents, you love your kids, discipline your kids. It's what God does. It's the way that he loves. So we must understand and receive the discipline from the Lord. Now, some of you right now today, your life may not be going the way that you want it to. It, it may be just not the story that you've written. You're under some pain and you're suffering. Things are just not going good. I'm not prospering. Hey, that's not me at all. You might be receiving the loving discipline from the Lord because you are lukewarm. You're trying to fix every problem in your life except your greatest need, which is Jesus Christ, suffering from a lukewarm heart for Jesus. And because he loves you, he says, I'll, be, I'll bring a bit of pain in your life. I'll bring some suffering. I'll bring those things because I love you and I want you to be rescued from your lukewarmness because your lukewarmness prevents you from experiencing life. Receive the discipline from the Lord. Hear him. Maybe you're going through that because of your lukewarmness. Be zealous. Repent. These are the words from a loving father. Those who have ears, let them hear Be zealous. Repent. Repent, we know, means a change of mind, a change of heart, change of behavior. And if you hear these words today and you change nothing, then nothing changes. Repentance is action. A change in the way that you live. And listen, if you're a Christian You better get really, really good at repentance. You will be a 
perfectionist at repenting. Martin Luther uh, said that repentance was the life of a Christian. It's everything that we do. Repent, repent, repent. We will never stop repenting. So get good at repenting. And for those that do repent, he gives a hope. Now right now we see this church here. We see Jesus as this great physician who has done this house call to a 6 in church. And he's diagnosed them with a condition that is critical. Right? It's critical condition for the church in Laodicea. But it's not terminal. And let's look what he says here in 20 through 22. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and goes, opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the first thing we hear here is him say is, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, you might have heard that this is uh, an evangelistic message to the lost world. Right, If you would just open the door of Jesus, he's standing outside the door, he can't get in, he's got no key to the door, and he's just depending and begging on your permission to open up the door so that he can save you. That is not what's happening in this passage. If God saved you, he didn't save you because you gave him permission. He saved you because he kicked in the door. Open the door and you saw him and you're like, how can I refuse this beautiful guest? He's awesome. Come into my life. Come into all the doors of my life. So this is not a message. This is not a passage here speaking to all of the lost world. This is a passage. Remember in the context, it's a letter to the church. It's a letter to the lukewarm church. Christians who've made a profession of faith inside the church. But as I said, they're in a cold and personal, business-like relationship with Jesus. He's on the front porch. He's a salesman. And there's this safe distance between the door. He's outside the door. You're cool if he stays out there. But he's pushing. He wants to give you more Jesus. And you're like, I don't really want more Jesus. And he said, that's not the life I've given you. Open the door. Let me come into you. Let me come into your home. Let me eat with you. Let me dine with you. Let me fellowship with you. Let me walk in intimacy with you. Because this is the kind of life and intimacy that I died on the cross for you to have. Not a lukewarm faith. And to the one who would hear. He gives a promise. Verse 21, he who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. I think the picture here is that there's authority with Jesus on the throne. He owns all things, cattle, a thousand hills. He owns everything in the world. And these Laodiceans thought that they would spend their lives accumulating money, passion, riches, in the hopes that they would actually be able to keep those things, that those are the greatest treasure in this world. And he says, hey, man, if you conquer, I'll let you rule all things as I rule all things. All things that are mine will be yours. And that's what being rich is all about. To the one who conquers, those who have ears, let them here. Now, the question I think we have to ask here, is he speaking to you, and are you listening? Is he speaking to you? What that feels like is a bubbling in your guts. Ouch. I think that's me. Ugh. I don't want to feel that. That's not good. I don't want to be spit out of Jesus' mouth one day. I don't want that. That's God speaking to you. 
The question is, is what are you going to do about that? Now, this letter, I'm going to read something that, that I've been studying as a pastor because this letter, listen, y'all, this, this letter is such a firm warning. I mean, it is just warning, 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 warning to the lukewarm Christian. And I read that, and I read a passage, I think about a passage in Ezekiel where uh, the Lord calls the pastor, the teacher, the handler of the Scripture, he calls them a watchman who's supposed to warn people. And I want to read it to you. This will kind of tell you why that there's, a, there's a responsibility of a pastor to preach hard things like today's letter. It says this in 33.1, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring the sword upon a land, and the people on the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman, that's their pastor, And if he sees the sword coming, which we've seen the sword coming today, upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes away any of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. Church, I'm a watchman. And God has warned us in his word today I am blowing the trumpet. If I don't blow the trumpet, then the blood is on me. That if any of you shall perish and be spit out of Jesus' mouth, then I'm the one who takes responsibility. I will take the blood will be on my hands. So I read that and I'm like, oh, what do I do? God, these are hard words today. How, How do I do this? How do I soften the blow when I say that there might be lukewarm Christians in our church. But my conscience is held captive by the word of God. And he says, blow the trumpet, man. Blow the trumpet. The question is, is are you, have you heard the trumpet today? Are you hearing the warning of the word of God in your life? And how will you respond? The band's going to come up, and I'm going to give you an opportunity today to respond to that trumpet. The way that you respond is by being zealous and repent. And today, what I would like to do, you know, many times in our in the in the in the scriptures, we see people demonstrating. Um, externally there's an external outward sign of an inward reality right when baptism happens uh they're expressing outwardly what's happening inwardly with communion we're expressing outwardly what's happening inwardly and sometimes in the in the scriptures there's a way that we would uh, express externally something that's happening with us internally so here's what i'm going to do today and ask you Uh, There is no prescription in the scriptures that says if you repent that you have to physically move to people to see you. But I would tell you that there's great power, humility to those who are willing to say, I'm blind, I'm a beggar, I am not prosperous, I am not wealthy, I am naked, I am homeless, but in Christ I'm none of those things and I have everything. To those who are willing today to say, I think I'm lukewarm and I'm ready to repent. During these songs, we've created some space up here at our stage. This is our makeshift altar today. Would you be so bold and so humble to get up today and walk towards the front? Bowing at the altar, saying, I confess, I repent, and God would do nothing but give you white garments clothe you forever, to be rich in Christ forever and ever by his grace.
Another opportunity for you today is that maybe you've never repented in your entire life of one thing. You've never got down on your knees and said, God, forgive me. Maybe it's your first time you've ever done that today. Listen, you have to first understand that you were born into the world as a blind, naked, deaf, dead beggar unto God. Powerlessness to do anything in your entire life. But because of his great mercy, his son dying on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, you can be made right with God and be clothed in the righteous robe of Jesus Christ. So I want to give you some space to do that. Let me pray. And then during these next few songs, you can do whatever you'd like to do. Move accordingly. Um, and let me just pray the Lord would move people. God, we love you. Your trumpet has been sounded. Your word has spoken to the people of the land of Smyrna, Tennessee, and our church today. God, I pray I've been faithful to blow that trumpet. In love, we do that. That my desire as your desire would be to people that would know you more, would love you more, that they would be zealous in the relationship of you, and you would lead them to life. God, put a burden through the power of the Holy Spirit of conviction on anyone in the room today. Don't let them leave comfortably. Don't let them leave suppressing good, godly conviction. Let them find freedom today. Freedom in Christ. In Jesus' name.